Hello again everyone, welcome back to another YYT Deck Tech Talk with Steve D. Today we're covering the Shikari XYZ combo, something new in Opus 12 and something that had kind of fallen by the wayside while I was trying to get through the bulk of the Legends for Legends spotlights this time around. Initially I really underhyped these guys. Partly it was a symptom of me not reviewing Wind for Opus 12 when the set was fully leaked, partly I saw the dreaded keyword party attack on Shikari X and I mostly stopped reading because I figured that party attacks, pretty much since they were created back in Opus 1, have been a terrible mechanic and something you only do when you're seriously on the back foot and have no other way of pushing through points of damage. Shikari X, Y and Z are rather different though because the reward for pulling off this party attack of 3 points of unblockable damage is very high, but frankly I don't even think that's the reason that Shikari X, Y, Z are particularly strong, or as it turns out really quite strong indeed. Instead, Shikari Y and Z, when they are on the field, produce this starter pain in YRP effect where for each other Sin Hunter that enters your field, you activate three backups and draw a card. And activating three backups and drawing a card by playing a two cost forward is actually insanely powerful, and maybe even stronger, no noticeably stronger as it turns out, than the pain in YRP. So this is something of a strange kind of a deck. Partly, the forwards are very good for tempo. Once you've got all three of them on the field, they are two CP 9Ks as a bare minimum, and two of them are going to have haste if you, you know, theoretically play all of them in a single turn. And then the turn after that, you've got the potential of dealing four more damage from the trigger of the party attack between the three of them, and then the party itself is still attacking and still needs to be blocked. So uh, it's, it's, it's a rather powerful deck, and there's a lot of different ways you can take it. I've seen slower variants that are playing a sort of an Earth Wind shell, but are playing Realm to fetch out Goblin and Unsaganashi, Unsaganashi to cover the spot weakness problem of these small forwards who are very dependent on each other, and Goblin to speed up the one that doesn't give haste to himself. I've seen variants as well that are playing a sort of a, a complete OTK combo uh, variant that tries to draw through your entire deck in, in a single turn. And while these versions are very powerful, and each of the versions in between are quite powerful as well, I've also seen a version that relies on the no-no backup, and then when you party attack with three forwards you get three backups back and, and do, I don't know, some, some crazy stuff there. But uh, I, I think that uh, some of these variants are a little bit win more, or you don't necessarily get extra payoff for all of the extra work you put in. However, whatever direction you decide to take X, Y, and Z Shikari in, they should all be relying on the Final Fantasy XI backup engine of Star Sybil. I do apologise for showing you so many Earth Wind decks, but when it's the best backup engine in the game and has been for more than half the game's lifetime, there's only so many things I can do without trying to sell you an unoptimal deck. Star Sybil is very powerful for taking complicated turns by letting you cheat later on in the game at a forward of up to 6 CP straight onto the field, but importantly searches for a category 11 character when they enter the field other than more copies of themselves, which does mean any of your Shikaris, whichever one you happen to be missing. But on top of that, you can also search for a real variety of backups with Star Sybil as well. This is probably not news to anyone. Two copies of Semilafina, rather powerful card and one copy of Apururu over here as well. Uh, Apururu can be used as kind of a free backup one, if it's your fifth backup that then recurs a card from your break zone and that's very powerful when we're trying to find all three of our Shikaris and ideally play them in a single turn. Another thing that is common to virtually every Shikari deck, whether you're playing hardcore combo or a little bit lighter combo, is Tilika. Tilika is a very powerful card and I'm really looking forward to the full art of this eventually being printed. When I first saw Tilika again, I thought, yeah, okay, it's not too bad, but I feel like I would like it if we could exploit this ability multiple times per turn with multiple activations. I have since changed my mind, and I think Tilika is plenty powerful enough in combo decks as she is. I don't think I would really play Tilika in a sort of standard Earthwind list, because I think it's too rare that you can take advantage in a mid-range deck of multiple cheapening effects. But if you are playing a combo deck like this, then you will really appreciate the fact that Tilika, Tilika's action ability will often give you upwards of 10 10 CP in a single turn by knocking one off so many different character prices. Playing Semilafina for one and then Star Sybil for two sounds quite appealing. Even more appealing than that is playing each of your Shikaris for only one CP and then still being able to benefit from their uh, slightly delayed auto abilities when your other Shikaris enter the field. And I think that uh, a great deal of the success of the Shikari deck is knocking them down to one CP in price, getting these two on the field and then playing Shikari X for one CP, drawing a card, activating three backups on entry. And uh, this deck is actually looking to abuse that on entry ability multiple times to generate huge amounts of CP and draw a ton of cards on the turn we decide to go off. To make Tilika a bit more consistent, three copies of Nostalin, 
Uh, so the brightest spot on the, the map. So let me move uh, Norstalen over there. Search for any FFCC backup on entry. Again, rather common in these elements and rather common in wind plus anything. One copy of Althea as well. Althea, I've mentioned in a few other videos, is my favourite hero this set for her tremendous list of repercussions and things she combos with. Partly, she is a pseudo two cost backup because you could refund one CP on your backups when she enters the field. That becomes all the more powerful with Tilika actually because she basically becomes a one cost backup. But then on a subsequent turn, being able to bounce another character back to your hand lets you either save things from removal, quite important in the case of the Shikaris, or more importantly, it lets you abuse on entry abilities multiple times, which is very important for your Shikaris that are all kind of free and all kind of draw cards. Or you could even do things like loop Apururu under the effect of a Tilika to be able to recur some cards for incredibly cheap as well. The big finish I have elected for in the Shikari list is Ildnarsh, and I have always wanted to play around Ildnarsh ever since seeing a really cool list courtesy of Robert Phillips and Joshua Freeman Birch that was like Water, Wind, Earth back at Nationals in Opus 5 or something. Very cool list. I think I managed to beat it actually by Zidaning and Ildnarsh out of their hand, but it doesn't change the fact that Ildnarsh is a really cool card who's always just waiting for that chance to be good. And I think that in a mid-range deck, the special on Eild Narsh, like I think the forward on Eild Narsh is actually quite reasonable. A 10k that just doesn't die and goes back to your hand if it ever does die or gets removed from the field, that's quite good. But uh, the special of take an extra turn and at the end of that extra turn you lose the game if you haven't won by then, that's very risky in a fair deck because I think fair decks do less degenerate things with their CP. They are less capable of creating scenarios where you are really far ahead. And if you're playing a fair deck that is capable of getting really far ahead, just try and win like a normal person. You don't need to flex the Ildnarsh. But again, just like Tilika, Ildnarsh really shines in these combo decks that just need that one more turn. And uh, Ildnarsh, even in the absence of being able to give haste to our Shikari party, I think that if you can deal a couple of points of chip damage in the early game with some of the other early game forwards I'm going to show you soon, then Ildnarsh's special is a very easy way, after you've comboed off and drawn a million cards, to take an extra turn and then party then and there with your Shikaris and usually deal enough damage to seal the game. We're playing three copies of Ildnarsh, but only one of this dark copy, so here's hoping it doesn't hit damage. If it does hit damage, don't play too riskily, don't play too over the top. We've got tons of ways to recur this Ildnarsh if it does get discarded, if you're playing against Winds of Dane or uh, any ice decks or something like that. Remember that Ildnarsh doesn't bounce back to your hand if it was discarded from hand. But uh, yeah, we can recur it if it gets discarded. And then we're playing two copies of the ice Ildnarsh. The Ice Eild Narsh is in the deck because basically I don't like the Dark Clog when we're trying to play a very agile deck that ramps out quite quickly and then explodes with this big combo turn. Often drawing Dark Cards is the thing that will brick our combo hands. So I want to downplay that. The Ice Eild Narsh is you can always discard to play a Star Civil or something like that and then recur them at a time they are important. And the one copy of Eild Narsh we can search out very easily. We've got multiple things that can search Eild Narsh. The one we've seen so far is Star Civil. So it's very consistent, so long as the Dark One doesn't hit damage. But that is not going to happen many times over the course of a Crystal Cup. Then we've got some cards that just so happen to be quite good in this archetype. We want to play a bit of protection. I think the uh, the the necessity to play protection is much higher in a combo deck than in, say, an aggro deck. And I think the mistake is considering the Shikaris to just be another dumb sort of an aggro archetype. Three copies of Zidane that looks through your opponent's hand and rips out a card of your choosing. In this scenario, you're going to want to look for board wipes, you're going to want to look for instant speed interaction that could kill your Shikaris during your own turn before you pull off a party attack at some point, and also anything that would be capable of disrupting an OTK sort of style of thing that uh, could interrupt a, an Ildnarsh activation as well. So Zidane is very powerful, maybe the most skill-based card in the deck, but also because it combos very well with our Shikaris, we're playing quite a lot of self-character bounce in this deck, and Zidane just so happens to be one of the best neutral things to bounce back to your hand or replay as well, because his on-entry ability is 95% of the reason we are playing the card. Two copies of Mayuni. Mayuni is useful for a number of things in this deck. I really like her in general. Uh, I think that if, if you only take one thing away from this video, it's that Mayuni is a card that you need to be trying out a little bit more. Any cheap on-entry abilities, any absolutely integral on-entry abilities on either forwards or backups, Mayuni is excellent for repeating. 
Zidane into Muni into Zidane, taking the two best cards out of your opponent's hand is going to slow them down by turns and turns, and on top of that you're drawing a card. Being able to Muni your Shikari X when you or any of your Shikaris when you've got another relevant Shikari on the field to either draw more cards, activate more backups, sometimes both is very powerful, and if you don't have any of these and you're struggling for backups, being able to Muni a Star Civil back to your hand to search another different Category 11 backup is incredibly powerful as well. Please don't cut these from the list. If you are experimenting with this archetype, Muni is one of the most important cards that I rather insist you try keeping. We're also playing two copies of Chocobo, which is effectively Muyuni on a summon. You can only return your forwards to hand, not your characters, but that's usually powerful enough, and again, 90% of the time we want to be looping either Zidane or Shikari X, and then maybe the rest of the 10% of the time you'll be looping one of your other Shikaris just so you can replay them, draw the card off of Chocobo, and then hopefully get some more advantage that way. Two copies of Tyro. The colour fixing is not really important here. I don't imagine there will be many games that we win by putting a 5 CP Old Narsh into play, although I have seen Stranger Things, and once you're on damage 5 it is quite a powerful on-entry ability. Rather, Tyro is here because it searches for any one of your forwards, which allows us to play some cool toolboxy things in the last few slots here, but also, most of the time, it's a secondary searcher for Yushikaris, and although 5 CP may seem kind of steep for that, we refund that CP very quickly through the card draw and activation of the Shikaris. One copy of Minfilia, basically the same reason as Aparuru. It's much less dependent on being your fifth backup, but it's also a little bit more statically expensive because you're always going to be paying 2 CP for it, whereas Aparuru feels like it's free if it is your fifth backup, and also Aparuru probably interacts more interestingly with Tilika. Two copies of Krill. Krill will not make an awful lot of sense yet because I've only shown you Chocobo as the summons, but when our summons are good and our summons do interact very positively with the Shikari lineup, we want to play more of them, and I don't think that playing Citra is a particularly good idea alongside Ildnarsh, so Krill is here as a sort of a value engine to get extra use out of our summons. Next, a couple of cards that are useful in the games where we turn out to be less of a combo deck and more of a beatdown or mid-rangey deck. One copy of Ash. Since there are so many cheap plays and so many repeatable plays in this deck, I think that Legend Ash can quite easily get her Storm Counter up to three characters cast per turn to draw you a card at the end of each turn, and that kind of helps you recover from maybe discard, maybe a bit of disruption or something like that. So Ash is quite useful when games turn grindy, as is the starter Shantotto. Shantotto is searchable, remember, by Star Sybil, so sometimes you can grab them on an EX, and if your opponent reaches the 7 character threshold on their field, you can resurrect any character of cost 3 or less when Shantotto enters the field, and at that point Shantotto will only cost 6. No, you cannot Star Sybil them in, even if they would cost 6. Shantotto is usually going to be reviving as a Dane for even more sort of a impeding of your opponent's progress, or one of your Shikaris, whichever one you're missing. One copy of Iris in here, or I'm, I'm assured she's called Iris in FF15, but that sounds silly to me. Almost as silly as that Noctis Matt. Iris, Iris, call her what you like, is quite a powerful card. The, what, the Earth, Wind, Rare of Opus 12, a dual element card. When she enters the field, you can activate a pair of Earth backups and a pair of Wind backups. This is quite powerful under Tilika's effect because Telica will make her only cost 3, you can either pay 2 Earth and 1 Wind CP, or vice versa, but you're still going to get back 4 backups. She's also a nice stompy card, has a nice unique name, and she can be discarded for either Earth or Wind CP. Quite powerful in this deck indeed, but I think the main reason we're playing her is because she can refund us CP in important times, and, and lets us take very complicated turns. One copy of Gabranth. Basically space is an issue. Space is always going to be an issue when nine of our slots are instantly taken up by the Shikaris, and I don't really feel confident enough to play two of the Shikari that I consider least important. The party attack is just so integral to the deck's success. Gabranth can find us our old Narshes, that's kind of the primary use uh, on turns where we need to combo off. I think that uh, being able to crack a Star Sybil to play 6 CP Old Narsh, and then 4 back or four remaining backups to play Gabranth, maybe you only need 3 backups if you've got a Tilika in effect, to search for the other Old Narsh for the special, very easy way to win, and also add 2 more bodies to attack on your field, and sometimes you'll want to find the Shantotto as well. I have elected to play a couple of copies of the Earth Wind Legend Shantotto in this set. Basically, I think one... Did I say Shantotto? I think I said Shantotto. I meant Yustola. Yeah, uh, I'm sure you can correct me in the comments. Yustola is a very powerful card, but so is the 5 CP when uh, 3 CP when Yustola from Opus 5. My goodness. This will teach me to uh, tan so much whiskey before I record a deck tech talk. 
You've got to do these things in Scotland. So, 3CP Earthwind Yustola is a very aggressive card. Basically, uh, it reduces the pressure on needing to party attack twice to kill your opponent. Yustola being maybe the most aggressive card in Earthwind, it's quite easy for her to deal 3, 4 damage if you play her on turn 3 or something like that before your opponent will even find an answer to her. And then once your opponent is on 4 damage, they're j or often 3 damage, they're just going to die as soon as you pull off a party attack. So I find Yustola really reduces the pressure and the necessity on getting a party attack off but if you want to play slower and more safe then the let's say it correctly this time 3cp opus 5 when Yustola is a very powerful piece of negation as well three copies of kusith i swear i've got full arts in another deck which is kind of like the fftcg equivalent of i swear i've got a real girlfriend you just don't know her she goes to a different high school kusith is a nice ex burst it's a very cheap way of getting back any one of our important characters you will probably have guessed by now this is a very toolboxy deck that relies on seeing the right character at the right time and it's also a nice cheap cantrip cast trigger for ash and it interacts very positively with krill as well one copy of Asura. Asura sometimes will feel like a worse copy of Kusith because it can bring back any of your two cost, but only your two cost characters. That does mean your Shikaris though, so it's quite powerful. And occasionally you can flash it back with Creel for quite cheap to get another use of your backups and stuff like that. So quite neat. A little bit of protection from mostly summons, but a little bit of graveyard protection as well in the form of Mist Dragon. And then we've got three copies of Diabolos because why not? It's Diabolos. Very good wind card, very good at getting rid of big things your opponent tries to terrify you with early on, and combos very well because once you reach five backups, which this deck typically will, it is a free summon to do something or other, and is a free cast trigger for Ash and the like. Thank you very much for watching. This has been Shikari XYZ Combo. Deck list, as always, is just in the description down there. And we we appreciate your likes, your describes, your comments, and your attention. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.